Good evening. Good evening. I didn't know I was supposed to speak until I arrived here this morning. But in the little time that I've been giving, I want to say a couple of things. I've had some advisors speak to me since I've been here. And they told me, don't water it down. Don't come with no Miller Light BS. But I have to say, I was told the same thing at Lane College. The BSU brothers asked me to come to speak. They said, keep it real, keep it raw. Don't sugarcoat it. So I tried to accommodate them. And before I finished, the same brother snatched the mic <laughs> out of my head. So I'm gonna try to be nice. They got a clock on me. If I go on too long, so I don't know how much I'm gonna get done. I really wanted to read some of my poetry or stuff like that, but I'm supposed to talk about success for African-American community college students. So I've been trying to figure out how I should approach this. And the best way I think I can approach it is by giving you some historical examples of what I consider successful community college students. So I, I, I grew up in Fresno, for those who don't know. I graduated from Edison High School. That's right. And probably two of the greatest Black American writers came from Fresno, myself of course, <laughs> but also our sister Shirley Ann Williams. If you Google her name, you see she graduated from Edison also, along with me. But when I left here, after graduating in 1962, I went to Merritt College down in the Flatland. And when I arrived at Merritt College, there were some students that I became friends with. One of them was named Huey Newton, and another was Bobby Seale. So these became my partners. And in terms of what was success at that time, when there was no BSU, no black studies, what did we do to gain our black consciousness that enabled us to basically shape up the world. With the Black Panther Party that came out of Merritt College, the Black Arts Movement came out of Merritt College, the East Coast, the West Coast version, of which I was a part. So a lot happened there, and a lot of it happened because we did what you might call now independent study. We wanted to get our black consciousness, and there was no black classes. So we studied on our own. We were self-motivated. We met in study groups to get our black consciousness together. We read books such as Black Bourgeoisie by E. Franklin Frazier. We read Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. We read the uh, Neocolonialism, The Last Days of Imperialism by Kwame Nkrumah. We read about Patrice Lumumba. We read about Nelson Mandela. We read about Fidel Castro. We read about Mao Zedong. And got our revolutionary consciousness that shook up the world. 
So when Mary Baraka was at San Francisco State not long ago and he said some students were complaining because they were having problems and getting flack from the administration, and Baraka said, is it, is it really difficult for you? Is it difficult for you? So sometimes we cry today when you don't have to cry. All you have to do is be organized. Get organized. So you have a beautiful statewide organization of community college students, and you need to use it for your advantage. Don't be crying about the price of textbooks or the price of tuition or the closing of classes. Organize and shut the whole system down until you get what you want. This is what you do. This is what I learned in Merritt Community College. And I carried it on. I came down here in 1969 to teach at Fresno State in black studies. Ronald Reagan said, get that nigga off campus by any means necessary. And that's what they did. Yeah, they got me off campus by any means necessary. We issued a court order banning me from the campus. But students retaliated to the extent that the president of the college resigned, Frederick Ness, because of student protests. And strangely, in 1972, I was teaching at UC Berkeley. So, Get organized, that's what made you successful. Trying to do it individually, talking about the administration, this and that, faculty, this, I don't care nothing about that. You get it, what you demand. Demand something. Know what you want. Half the time you don't even know what you want. And all you do is just react, react, react. When they cut to damn all that, state what you want, it's unconditional. Ain't no conditions on what we want. You give it up, I get on the hell up out of here. That's how I come from. That's what I come from. I don't know what y'all talking about. That's how we get it. That's what they say. That's how we roll. So, this is a struggle for your education. And don't you remember when you were able to lie?
to San Francisco State. And when I transferred, we had the Negro Student Association. And there was a big battle to change the name from Negro to Black. And, and so we fought over it. There's some people here that were there. And it became the PSU, Black Student Union. And then it went on, the PSU went on to fight for what? Black Studies. And they brought in Dr. Nathan Hare, who had just been kicked out of Howard University, a black sociologist, just as Howard had kicked out another great sociologist, E. Franklin Frazier, who wrote Black Bourgeoisie. So Nathan came here, attempted to establish the first black studies program in America. Of course, he was ultimately fired by President Hayakawa, and there, what, what happened next was the longest strike in American academic history by the students at San Francisco State fighting for black and third world studies. So we have that today. So you get what you want, you get what you submit to. Like Dr. Harris said, there can be no, no, no masters except by those who want to be slaves. So don't talk about no master. Your job, for no not say, your job is to replace the master. So that's what you should be doing with this organization. Replacing the corrupt bureaucracy that wants to continue charging you and charging you and charging you. A student of my friend right the other day said, how am I going to pay $600 for books? Well, I'm going to get $600 from them. And I came out with a book that was $100 and Negroes act like they didn't go to college and they never paid $100 for a book. To me, it was subliminal racism because they didn't Think that I was, how could I be qualified to charge a hundred dollars for a book? Well, well, you paid for the white man's books that brainwashed you, even the scientific books, racist, white supremacy science, pseudoscience. You paid for that, ate them up. But a black man come with a book for a hundred dollars. So, how much time do I have left? <laughs> See, you don't want to get me started over here. You have to call the campus police. That's what they usually do. I've been escorted off of many campuses and escorted out of some countries. I'll just tell the brother right here. I was escorted out of the police, thrown on a plane. Slam the door shut. And I have to just, I'm gonna just tell the story. They are, uh, I was in a, in way out in the jungle, as I told him, and in a little hut. And a drunk man came by singing, Boy, they come to get you in the morning. <laughs> you been down here teaching that black power. They come to get you. <laughs> and we, we, me and my wife said, I wish that old Negro would get away from my door. But the next day I had to go into town on a boat and I was technically under arrest because there was an a, 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 a undercover agent on the, on the boat with a rifle. So anyway, I get arrested and they take me to the Ministry of Home Affairs. And the Ministry of Home Affairs says, uh, your presence, he read my deportation order. Your presence is not beneficial to the welfare colony of the British Honduras, to the British colony of Honduras. And therefore, you will be deported at 4 p.m. on a plane for Miami. So until then, you uh, shall be placed under arrest. So they took me to the police station, and they sat me down. They didn't put me in a cell or handcuff me or anything. They sat me down. And in a minute or two, I was surrounded by black police. So I couldn't figure out what was getting ready to happen. 